most times when you go to a funeral, it's on the inside of the little flyleaf. And we did that with Jean when she passed. We put the 23rd Psalm on there. But I want to talk to you this morning about the 23rd Psalm and the part where it says, We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You remember that part? Yes. We are meant to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Come on. Yes, because that's where the lost are, ladies and gentlemen. That's where the ones that need God Almighty are. They're in the valley of the shadow of death right now. But we walk through it and we fear no evil. We fear no evil. Our cup runs over, praise God. He has anointed us with goodness and joy and gladness. Hallelujah. Yes, He has anointed us. And He intends us to go where the demon-possessed are and set them free in Jesus Christ. I listened to these testimonies this morning. I told Ricky, you may have heard me. I said, or I said it to you. We got a room full of preachers right here. Praise God. Giving testimony of the living God and the power to not only save, but to deliver and heal and bless. Now, Isaiah 61 verse 1 through 3. Before I read it, grab somebody's hand. O oh Lord God Almighty, as we as your children are here before you this morning, Lord, you have anointed us with the oil of gladness and joy, love and joy and peace. And what we got, money can't buy. Amen. Not the millions or billions or whatever's on this planet, it cannot buy because we only get it through the name of Jesus. And it is that confidence in us, Lord that we are the anointed ones of God. Lord, you're at the right hand of the Father where you're supposed to be until the time that the Father says, go get the family and bring them home. In the meantime, Holy Spirit, you're empowering us as the children of God. And you have given us the authority in Jesus' name. Lord, you gave us that authority. Go forth and do your works in this earth, in the valley of the shadow of death. And we're to go and tear the devil's kingdom to pieces as much as we can. We won't win the complete battle, Lord, because you've won the war and we're marching according to your orders. And we go when you tell us to go and we stop when you tell us to stop and we do when you tell us to do because you're our great, great commander and you always send us into battle knowing that the victory is already won. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Isaiah 61. Do you know it's where it is in your Bible? I want you to find it. Come on. This is important this morning. Isaiah chapter 61. It's on page 1,171. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I like a wild bunch. Praise God, hallelujah. The Spirit, say it with me now. I'm reading out of the King James Version. Yours is a little bit different if you've got a different one. But we need to read down through here because there are some very important things in this passage. Hallelujah. Read it with me now. The Spirit of the Lord God. No, wait, wait, wait. Well, i got to stop you all over again. When you say upon me, yeah, you can stand up if you want to. When you say the word me, I want you to take that big finger that the devil uses sometimes to point it at somebody else's face and say something that you're not supposed to say, I want you to put that finger right here on your own chest. Your own, say my chest. Yes, right. Alright, let's do it again now. You know your instructions. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And they shall build 
behold the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall repair the way cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be named priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory shall you boast your shame. For your shame you shall have double and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. For I the Lord love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. Here we go. For he hath clothed me with the joyfulness of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Yes, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou, O God, art with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the dream that I had this morning has to do with this church. I did not recognize it to start with. I did not realize it to start with. When you're in the middle of the dream, it's happening, whether you're riding a bike or flying in a plane or whatever it is, you're in that dream and you're part of it. And when I woke up, it was like, oh, wow, I just stepped out of it, and it but it's still going on. And I just had to just sit on the side of the bed and just kind of digest and think about what I had just experienced in this dream. And in this dream, when I'm in a house. The house is open from one end to the other. Kind of like this room here, big room, not a piece of furniture in it. And there's one door that goes outside. And I went outside, I was looking around and everything, and all of a sudden people, there was a lot of people inside the house. And there were some other rooms, there were other, other doors. After you come in this front door, there was two or three other doors that went into other rooms. And there was a lot of people scattered around throughout the house in different locations and different places. And all of a sudden the people went to screaming like, what, you know, something terrible is going on. Snake, 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 snake. And I want you to see if you can interpret some of this to keep it to yourself. <laughs> and so I run back in the house, in the door of the house, and there was a snake in there on the, on the floor. It had to be been anywhere from 8 to 10 foot long. It was a huge snake. It was kind of tan in color. But it was terrorizing everybody in the house. And I went to try, and as I remember... I happened to have a sword in my hand, but it wasn't really what we would say was a sword like we normally think of a sword. It was a machete. It was a long machete. Now, I've got machetes at home. That, now, you can go to a Harbor Freight or even uh, Walmart. You can buy a machete for about $5, five or six, seven dollars. You can buy a machete. It's actually a sword. Oh, yeah. In Africa, Thou hundreds of thousands have been killed with that sword, the machetes. Yeah. And they're shaped different ways sometimes on the blade. This was a machete, and it was one of the long ones. And I had it in my hand, 
And I ran back into the house, and there was that snake, and the snake was slithering going down the middle of this big room. And I run to go after the snake, and it disappeared. Well, where did the snake go? Did y'all see the snake? Where did the snake go? It disappeared. Well, then suddenly the snake appeared over here. And people went to screaming over here, and I run over there, and the snake disappeared again. I said, oh my goodness, where's the snake? He says, it was here, but it scared us, and it ran away, and and then, all, and then people in another room, and I'm still in the big room, and they would come running out, and some wanted to run out the door. I said, no, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. They were going to run out the door. And I said, we're going to kill this snake. Amen. We're going to kill this snake. And I went, I seen the snake, and it was slithering again, going this way and that way, and running all, just running people, scaring people. People was jumping and knocking each other down, trying to get away from the snake. And the snake was just having a heyday. Oh, yes, he was. He was just running to and fro. And every time I'd go after him with that knife, I'm going to kill that joker. Oh, yes. And he'd disappear on me. Disappear. And finally, as I'd run to the other end of this big room, and I couldn't find the snake again, I looked around, and the people back over at the other end, they're screaming again, the snake, the snake, the snake. And I run back there, and there was one of these little old kid's toy things that's like a little car. You've seen these cars, that, little cars that a kid, a little kid can get inside the little car, and then they pedal, or they have to walk with their own feet. You know, it's a little car, it's too little for an adult, but a kid can get inside it. And I, the snake was inside that little car that little kids use. And I jumped on top of that car and I took that machete, it was a long one, and I slammed that thing down through that car right into that snake. Right into that snake. But I didn't get his head. I wounded him and I wounded him terrible. Oh, he slithered out of that snake, out of that little old car, you know, and uh, Oh, he run around over here, and I'm coming after him now. I'm going to chop that joker's head off. I'm going to put an end to him. He ain't terrorizing these people in this house no more. When does a house become a home? Yeah, when you make it a home. It might not have much in it, but there's no place like home. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And every time we move from house to house or wherever it is, we make that a home because we bring Jesus in. You know, yes, yes, yes. And so, praise God. Here's that thing now. It's on the floor, and it is wounded terribly. I've hit it. I have wounded it. I have cut it deep, but I did not give it a killing blow yet. And I raise that machete up, and I'm fixed. I'm going to cut that thing's head off. And suddenly, right in front of my eyes, it turned into a little kitten. And some of the people says, oh, a little kitten. It's so precious. Oh, look at the little kitten. I says, oh, that ain't no kitten, folks. It's a masquerade. It's a lie. It's nothing but a lie. And I reared back and I chopped that snake, but he moved. He suddenly turned back into the snake when he knew I wasn't tricked by his deception. And he turned back into the snake and he moved just as I swung. I was going to cut his head off. Well, I cut him off about, a, he had about 10 inches worth of body left. No kidding, I, didn't, I missed his head. See, because he moved on me, because he knew that knife was coming down. And he's wiggling, he's wiggling, and I could tell that jerker was fixing to grow, his, grow himself a whole new body right there in front of me. And I said, oh, no, you won't. Not in this house. Not in this house. And I reared back that time, and I'm going to kill him, and I did. But the instant before my arm came down, instead of a snake's head, it was a dragon's head. He had been found out, and it was known who he really was, and I chopped his head off. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the, love, the devil loves to go to church. Yes. He loves to get into churches. And sometimes he masquerades as somebody like a movie star up on there behind the pulpit. Or sometimes he gets in the nursery. And as I analyzed that and I thought about that, 
where would a little kid's car be in a big house in a church? It'd be in the nursery, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. You see, it, I knew and I realized it was prophetic. And there were people running out the front door of the church. Oh, they're leaving. They're not having nothing to do with it. I said, don't leave. You'll miss what God's going to do. Because God's got plans, ladies and gentlemen. He's got plans for this church. And it's not about us. It's about Him and those lost souls out there that still don't know they need Jesus. And we're here. And we are supposed to be walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Because they're walking in death every single day. Every day, every day, every day. Not realizing, realizing that their life is hanging in the balance. Because they already belong to Satan. They already do. And they don't know that they've been deceived and tricked by him and lied to him. Why do you think that snake turned into a little kitten? To play upon the feelings of the other people that was there. And, and sure enough, out of the people that was inside that house, they said, oh, look, it's a little kitten. Oh, the sweet little baby. It wasn't a big old full-grown cat. It wasn't a newborn. It was a little kitten. Yeah, that would just touch everybody. See, the Bible tells us, do not be ignorant of Satan's devices. Amen. He will hook you hook, line, and sinker. There's always bait. If you're going to catch a fish, you always use bait. And how do you catch humans? By the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he captures them by the thousands. Every day he's capturing them by the thousands. I want to read something to you. I got, off, I got this off of a program. It was actually sent to me by somebody. I don't know whether Linda sends so many things. I can't keep up with all of them. So they're just, but they're good. They're good. And some, some of them I'm able to see and some of them I don't. But I don't know if she did this or not. But it's called The New Prophetic. And it's, it's really what's going on in the world and the church right now. The church is in trouble, ladies and gentlemen. I'm talking about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. It's in trouble. Now, many places around the world is as healthy as it can be because they're being persecuted unto death. And people are standing even into the point of death. I've looked at the book of Revelation many, many times. And you will find yourself scattered through all the horrible, terrible times that are coming in the future. There will be those phrases in there that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their life unto the death. And there's phrases just like that scattered around through the midst of the book of Revelation. Why? Because God is saying, hang on church, keep going and keep going and don't give up. I'm coming for you. Amen. One way or another I'm going to receive you unto myself. Joshua 3 verse 4 says this. And this is where we are. And I've known it since the end of January that the world in the church has turned a corner. It's turned a corner. Joshua 3, 4 says, For you have not passed this way before, and none of us have. Not a one of us have. For the future that's in front of us, we've none of us gone that way. This is new, ladies and gentlemen. New things. You can't put new wine in old wine skins. Did you hear me? Yes. Jesus told us about that. He said the wine will create such pressure that the old wine skins aren't going to be able to handle it. It's got to be new things, ladies and gentlemen. Us old pastors has got to be turned into new men. We've got to be new preachers with new words coming out of our mouth straight from the throne of God. Yes. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, when you go to church, I don't care where it is. If God don't show up, you ain't had church. Amen. Pardon my ain't. You've not had church. Is God here? Yes. Boy, that was weak. <laughs> are we here, Ricky? Yes, we are. Is God here? Yes. All right. Yes. Yes, thank you, Orlando. You've not passed this way before. As the world is shaking and shifting, God is shifting His church, and it's painful. Yeah, we've gone through some rough times. 
Across the globe, the church is going through a major process of sifting, purification, and reshaping. Say reshaping. reshaping. Things that were hidden are being exposed. Secrets are being brought into the light. I firmly believe that God is behind it all. Who, who, I don't know who wrote this. Not the sin, of course, but the exposure. He is cleaning his house. He's overturning the tables. Yes, God's going to walk right through the middle of his church and he's going to turn over the tables of the old ways. Amen. Your old things and ways of doing things, he's going to turn them over and it's going to be new things. And you may not like it. You think, oh, the devil's getting into the church. I think God's getting into the church. <laughs> And there's no Ichabod over the door of our church, ladies and gentlemen. You know, you heard the story about that. Man goes up there and he's knocking on the door of the church. Open the door, I want to get in. He looks and there's another man standing here beside him. He says, don't worry. He, said, he realized it was Jesus. He said, I've been trying to get in there for years. <laughs> that's, that, we laugh about that, but that's terrible. It is terrible. <clears throat> Jesus is overturning the tables. He's calling His people back into alignment with His priorities and purposes. This is a new era. 22, this year is a new era, ladies and gentlemen. You better wake up if you don't realize it. Maybe, you personally, maybe you're personally experiencing something of this. A church you've loved for many years now feels shallow and hollow. Oh, God, have mercy on us. It seems as if everyone is just th going through the motions, doing what they've always done, and you're struggling to stay. The truth is, the old way of doing things just won't work anymore. The old wineskin was able to contain the wine for the last 30 years, but that wineskin now must be replaced. As a church leader, honestly, I'm not sure what this even looks like. I don't know who this man is. We desperately need real-time revelation as we follow Jesus step by step. step. Say step by step. step by step. This unknown and uncertain future, and it is. Like Israel in the wilderness, we've all, we only move when the cloud moves. We camp when it stops, and we are totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. The show is over. Of course, that's the way it is always supposed to be. But somewhere along the way, we begin to rely on wisdom, ingenuity, gifts, charisma. Oh, charisma was so important than character. Programs were more important than presence. Numbers were more important than relationships. And buildings and budgets were more important than the anointing of God and the hype took the place of the holiness. See, without holiness, you're not going to go to heaven. You're not. And if you're living in sin, you better get out of it fast. Repent and stop it. Churches that cling to the old wineskin will not survive. Or if they do, their activity will be shown to be empty and lifeless. I don't want that kind of church. No. I want a church that's on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. A new breed of leaders is being called in from the sidelines. They are men and women after God's own heart. They will take their place, pursue His presence, and equip His people. I believe in this, in this new area. Gone are the celebrity pastors, the seeker-sensitive services, trying to be relevant, gimmicks, immorality being covered over, manipulation and control of people, success metrics of church size budgets, crass humor, entertainment, and light sermons. Instead, we will see a renewed focus on holiness and the fear of the Lord. What does the Bible say about the fear of the Lord? It's the beginning. The beginning of wisdom. You better be afraid of God. You know, I told a man one time, a Jewish man, and he didn't pay any attention to it. I said, you know, one day when the Messiah comes, he's going to kill half of the Jews that survive the, the tribulation period in Armageddon. What? Oh, we don't fear God. I said, you better. You better. You better fear God. Now, he's, to, he's a Jewish man. He goes to synagogue every Saturday. I said, you better fear God because Messiah. See, there's a whole chapter in chapter 25 telling about the, the bridesmaids, the ten. Yeah. 
Half of them make it and half of them don't. Guess what happens to the half that don't? God says with fury in Ezekiel. He said, I will cause all of my brothers to pass under the rod and half of them I will slay. It's in the book of Ezekiel. Yeah, Jesus is going to kill half the Jews that he saves at the Battle of Armageddon because the hard-headed and stubborn, stiff-necked Jew says, I don't care if you're the Messiah or not. I'm not bowing down to you. Jesus said, oh, that's fine for you. And they're dead. I'm sorry. That's in the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, whether you like to hear it or not. What do you think Jesus does when he comes at the Battle of Armageddon? He slays them by the thousands and thousands and thousands with the breath of his mouth. Yes, he does. Exercising the wrath of God. You better know the Lord. We want to see that renewed focus on genuine community, the kingdom of God, radical obedience. I don't want to be called lukewarm. I want to be called radical. I remember Brett came in one day with a shirt on and said, Jesus freak. That was a long time ago. Yeah, Jesus freak. You remember that, Brett? Huh? Okay, okay, I didn't remember all that, but I remember the Jesus freak. <laughs> yeah. And everybody kind of laughed and giggled a little bit and everybody, Jesus freak. Oh, yeah, you radical thing. You're not radical. Well, we better be in the days to come. And guess what? It may cost you your life. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, you better serve Jesus because he's the only one that can save your life even in death. Even in death. He can save your life even in death. Yes, he can. The anointing. The anointing. Ladies and gentlemen, that means the Holy Spirit. You've anointed my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the anointing that breaks and destroys the yokes of bondage. But I want to tell you this, when it talks about Satan, when I went to bring the last blow on that snake, it suddenly uncovered itself and the head lengthened right on out and became a dragon's head as I killed it. And I killed it with that sword. And what is that sword? The Word of God. See, ladies and gentlemen, we're supposed to be having on the whole armor of God every day, not just on Sunday. Because if you're doing it just on Sunday to impress your own self, the devil will laugh at you. He'll laugh at you because he'll catch you unawares. He goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he will eat your lunch. He loves to eat your lunch, to make a fool out of you. Yes. Repentance and deliverance. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there was a day one time when Jesus was ministering that tells us, it's told about in John the 10th chapter and the 6th chapter where Jesus said to all these disciples he's got out here, he's got lots and lots of disciples now. Whole countrysides are following him. And he says, one day you're going to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they all look, begin to look at each other. He's wanting us to commit cannibalism. See, Jesus used metaphors and analogies. And he loved to use them because he can speak wisdom to those that have ears to hear and nothing to those who don't. And we know today exactly what Jesus meant. How many have ever ate the body of Jesus and drank the blood? I have lots and lots and lots of times. We call it Holy Communion. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you do it in remembrance of me. It was a metaphor that Jesus was saying. He didn't mean for him to chop his body up and eat the meat and drink the blood in a cup. No, he was talking about us taking him inside of us. And the Bible says if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. Yes, prayer and intercession. 
I was praying this morning, and, and it's been my habit to pray for every one of you by name, even the you new ones. Yeah. yeah. On Sunday morning, that's been my habit for a long time. You know what God told me this morning? And I went, oh, oh, uh, yes, sir. He said, I want you to pray for everybody else on every other day of the week, but this day, I want you to spend time with me. I said, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> he said it was, he considered it a special time. A special time. And I did. I did. And see, ladies and gentlemen, for us to come up here, we got to drink from the well. Yes. And my, I got a granddaughter-in-law that lives in Macon, Georgia, and she's just had a baby, little baby girl a while back, and she's nursing now. And they got talking about how much water do you have to drink when you're nursing? And somebody said, you got to drink almost a gallon of water a day. And she said, oh, she said, I'm trying, but I can't drink that much. <laughs> Yeah, because if you've nursed before and you know that takes a lot out of you. But you've got to be eating and drinking in order for the baby to be eating and drinking. That's right. It's the same thing with here. If me or Ricky or any other minister that comes up here before you, and I guard this pulpit, ladies and gentlemen. I guard this pulpit. Now, we're going to have a world evangelist coming next Sunday, Dan and Linda Rushing. And they minister in Poland. They minister all over in Africa, here in the United States. We've had them here one time before, almost two years ago. And they'll be coming here next Sunday. And I want you to fill this room up. You need somebody that needs some healing? Bring them here. Because the evangelist, one of the things that God does with the evangelist is confirm the word with signs following. That's why you generally don't see many of the signs following when it's the pastor up here bringing the word. Or we're laying hands, although thank God we get the healings too. Amen? Oh yes, there's been many a miracle done right here. Yes, there sure has. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And God confirms His Word that it is the truth. And you come here and you get prayed for and you walk away knowing that God has answered your prayer. You might have a twinge here. And, oh, the devil will put one on you before you get to your car trying to make you believe that it ain't happened. No, it didn't happen because I got this pain still right here. Here. No, you tell him. Remember, he's a liar. He's a liar. Just like the song she sang this morning. The devil is a liar. When you've got it from God, he'll try and steal it right back away from you. Don't listen to the devil. Amen is right. This depth and disciple making, biblical and prophetic preaching, godly leadership that annoys, anoints the saints. Who was the most, most anointed before the throne of God? The devil was when he was the, an archangel. Your anointing doesn't mean a thing if you're not obeying God and being humble before Him. Devil don't care how anointed you are and how much you speak in tongues or you do this, that, and the other. The Bible lets us know that there will be many that day that Jesus will say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You might have done miracles and signs and wonders. That don't mean a thing. It's your obedience and submission to God Almighty that keeps you as a family of God. Jesus promised, He said, I will build my church. And he praised God he's doing it. Yes, he is. And everyone in this room here has gone through hell and fire and brimstone. One way or another. I know. I know many of you and your stories and what you've gone through. Some of you young people, you don't understand and you don't know what us old folks have gone through. Why we praise God. Why we cry. Why we get so excited about God. Because I found out, ladies and gentlemen, there ain't nobody ever loved me like He loves me. Nobody's ever cared for me like He cares. And nobody's done for me and willing to do every single day. God's a good God. Yes, He is. Hallelujah. 
He's preparing people right now for intense turbulence, even persecution ahead, and ultimately for His glorious return. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus doesn't want to come back for a bride that's compromised, lukewarm, half-hearted, passionless, and powerless. He's coming back for a bride, ladies and gentlemen, that's kicking the devil out. Yeah. Yes, amen. Amen. He wants a radical, devoted, spotless, spirit-empowered remnant who will stand boldly for His righteousness and demonstrate the kingdom of God. So we're to pray for church leaders. We're to pray for wounded believers. We're to pray for revival and reformation of the church and pray for an awakening and a harvesting of souls in this world. In Revelation 22 verse 12, Jesus said, Look, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. He's coming back for a bride that's without spot, without wrinkle. What's the spots? That's some things you're still doing that you're not supposed to be doing. Right? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are you here? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Clean up your life. <laughs> Lay it down. <laughs> Quit picking it up. Quit looking at it. Quit playing with it. Stop it. Stop it. You can't do any of those things of the world when you get to heaven. Did you know that? That's right. Not none of them. Commit your life to Christ now, as of today. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. I titled this message, What is a Spirit-Filled Church? It is a church on fire for Jesus. Amen. When we only have three people, maybe four or five, going out for a prayer station on a Saturday, I said, Lord God, have mercy on us. Have, thank God for the ones that do. Thank God for the ones that do. But see, ladies and gentlemen, we're small in some ways at this time. I've told you the story about over at uh, Paul Zink's church that time and he's holding up a, a symbolic spear in his hands and says, God, we're a spear in God's hands. You know, there's no actual spear there. He's just holding it up. You're, we're imagining that. And I looked up at him and there's a whole big old gigantic church slammed full of people and I said, well, Lord, what are we? He says, which part of that spear, that imaginary